Hi, this is Dennis Calhoun from the Old North Church in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Coming to you today from the sanctuary. It's been a long time since we were all gathered in this place. Much has changed in our world, but one thing has not, and that is the power and presence of the God who calls us here. We're delighted that you're joining us this week for worship, and I'd encourage you to take a moment before we begin to scroll down your YouTube screen and find the Show More button so that you can follow along in the order of service. Because no matter who you are or where you are on life's way, you are welcome here. So let's take a moment to take a deep breath, breathe in the spirit of the living God as we make that transition from whatever it was we were doing before we got here to doing what we're called to do now. And that's to be in the presence of our living God. Now let's be called to worship. Come, let us be God's community. Come with love. Let us be one in the spirit. Come with curiosity. Let us come as one body, one church, one people, one planet. Come with hope as we come to Christ's table. Community is built. Come, let us worship together. Hi, at church, I'm Lindsay Popperson, your associate minister, and I'm coming to you from our sanctuary here at Old North. Please, will you join me as we pray our prayer of invocation? God, who multiplied the loaves and the fishes, we come before you today with so many hungers. We are hungry for community, for meaning, for purpose. We are hungry for connection, and for solitude. We are hungry for justice and equity. We bring all of our hungers to you. On this World Communion Sunday, bind us together with faithful people throughout the world who eat at the table you have set. Remind us that all people are our neighbors and hear us as we pray together with one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God, you created us for community and tasked us with caring for one another. Help us to see how our hearts have become numb to the suffering of others. 
God, you created a world of abundance where there was enough for all. Forgive us for the times our hoarding of wealth has meant that others go hungry. God, you created us to rely on one another. Save us from our rugged individualism and self-reliance so that we might be drawn into interdependence. Hear us as we examine our consciences, confess our sins, and ask for your grace in the silence that follows. Amen. People of God, receive this good news. Though our human love is sometimes fickle and fleeting, God's love is unconditional and never-ending. God's grace does not keep a record of our wrongs. You are loved, you are forgiven, and you are free to learn, to grow, to change. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. I'm Karen Kilty, the Director of Children's Ministries here at Old North Church. This is the time in our service for moments with children. And if we were here, we would invite our children to come forward and sit right here. So this morning, while you're in your home and I am here in the sanctuary, a place that we call home, I invite you, children, young and young at heart, to lean in just a little closer. This is a very special day in the life of the church, celebrated by Christians all around the world. It's called Worldwide Communion Sunday, which is always the first Sunday in October. People in different towns and cities, states and countries, people who speak different languages and worship with different styles, use the same basic ingredients to celebrate communion together. The recipe is simple. It is to remember that we love God, and God loves us. We love Jesus, who shared a special meal with his friends. We remember how much Jesus loves us whenever we take this time to receive bread and grape juice. It is a simple recipe for living a good and faithful life. In the last many years, our children have gathered on the last Sunday of September to knead and shape little loaves of bread. We were able to use them on World Communion Sunday. Shapes of hearts and fishes and crosses were all left to rise and then bake until they were gold and brown. And as much fun as it was to make the bread, it was so special to see the bread laid out on the communion table. And last year, children, we watched you bring the gifts, bread, to the table to sit right up front and to be able to listen. And for some of you, you served alongside Dennis and Lindsay and the deacons, truly gifts from your hearts and hands. The bread we made was a simple recipe, flour, oil, salt, water. God's special recipe is simple, too. When we follow this recipe for holy and faithful living, we find that our lives can be easier and our re relationship with God stronger. Only days before Jesus died, he gathered his friends, the disciples, for supper to celebrate Passover together. While they were eating, Jesus asked them to remember him whenever they got together and they had bread or to drink wine and juice. Much later, after the disciples realized that Jesus was alive in new ways and that they too felt alive in new ways, they began to eat together on a regular basis to remember Jesus. There was so much that they didn't understand, but they were certain of one thing. When you follow God's way as Jesus did, we are a part of a community that is much bigger than ourselves. And within that community, everyone is welcome, and everyone is fed and cared for. So wherever we are in the world today, 
whether you're in your homes and you're with families, at a lighthouse, in the garden, we can use this simple recipe of goodness and welcome and remember that Jesus asks us to do this. As he said, remember me. Will you pray with me? Holy One, you unite your people from around the world into one family, not just today, but every day. As we receive communion together, even though we are apart, help us to be reminded how much you love us and open us to feel that love deep, deep inside. Thank you for giving us a special recipe to follow and to lead us to live our very best life. Amen. Good morning, friends. I hope that you're all healthy and enjoying our beautiful fall. I'm sure that you are probably all starting to settle into new routines and schedules by now. My name is Sarah Delgado, and I'm the director of the youth choirs here at Old North Church. I'm truly sad that I won't be able to meet with all of my young singers in person, and I look forward to the day that we can meet again. However, as they say in theater, the show must go on. I would like to invite any and all young musicians starting in grades 1 all the way to 12 to join me as we will continue to meet, but online. The format will be slightly different this year, and our focus has shifted somewhat, but we are exploring new and creative ways to continue to involve the choirs in our online services. On another note, I would like to announce that this year is the 40th anniversary of the Old North Festival Chorus. We are currently planning an online celebration that looks back over all of the fantastic music making over the years. It's such a special time, and it will be a beautiful celebration of all that has been accomplished and all that the Festival Chorus has contributed to this community. We're currently looking for volunteers from the Festival Youth Choir, both past and present, to participate. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My information can be found on the church website at www.onchurch.org. I look forward to seeing some of you again soon. I have found that our young musicians have cultivated a caring and loving community that it loves to make music together. I'm positive that this year will not change that. With that said, I have a special young woman to introduce to you this morning. She's an incredibly young musician and person. She's one of the many children that grew up singing in the youth choirs, then on to adult choir and festival. Annie Burgett is currently a sophomore at Northwestern University, studying vocal performance and philosophy. This past summer, she studied the role of Susanna in The Marriage of Figaro, and she is playing the Sandman in a virtual production of Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel this fall at Northwestern. Annie also sings in the Baroque Contemporary Ensemble, a choir that performs cutting-edge contemporary repertoire. She's enjoyed studying all aspects of vocal performance at Northwestern, from choral singing to solo art song and opera productions. She's looking forward to returning to campus and singing in person, once it is deemed safe to do so. Annie discovered her love of choral singing and classical music as a member of the Old North Church Choral Programs. We're so proud to have had her grow up here, and she's so special to us here at Old North. This morning, Annie will be singing En Prière by Gabrielle Foray. I think that you'll find the text of this piece appropriate for this morning. While the piece is in French, I'll be reading the English translation for you. If a child's voice can reach you, O my Father, hear from Jesus kneeling before you. If you choose me to teach your laws, on the ground I will know how to serve you, King of Kings. O light, on my lips, Lord, put the truth, so that he who doubts with humility revere you. Don't give up on me. Give me sweetness necessary to soothe ailments, relieve pain and misery. Reveal yourself to me, Lord, in whom I believe and I hope. For you, I want to suffer and die on the cross of Calvary.
Good morning. I'm Diane Thomas, a deacon at Old North Church. This morning's first scripture reading is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. The Song Vineyard. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated. And briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. We've heard these words from Scripture. Let us find within them the word of God. Good morning. Our second gospel reading this morning is from Matthew 21, verses 33 through 46, also known as Jesus's parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you ever read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. We have heard these words from the scriptures. Let us find in them the word of God. 
Friends, will you pray with me? Almighty God, give us ears to hear your story in these words of Scripture. Give us eyes to see your story in the faces of those around us. And give us faith and understanding that by your grace, we might know how to better love and serve you. Amen. For the past few weeks, our scripture lessons have been a series of parables from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus certainly didn't invent parables, but he used them to great advantage in his preaching. Parables are stories that draw the listener in by invoking familiar scenes of everyday life, but they always contain a surprise. Often the surprise is that the parable turns out to be not about the characters in the story, but about the people listening to it. If the people Jesus was addressing didn't get the first parable, he would often tell them another. Today's gospel lesson is the second parable Jesus addressed to the chief priests and elders of the temple in Jerusalem when they questioned him about the source of his authority to say and do the things he'd been doing. He had been creating quite a stir since arriving in Jerusalem from up in the hills. The authorities questioned his motives. Jesus answered with parables. Biblical scholar Sharon Ringe points out that the parable begins with a description of business as usual in occupied Roman Palestine. A landowner established a vineyard, then became an absentee landowner, returning to his own country, as often happened in the far-flung territories of the Roman Empire. The tenants were in charge of overseeing the productivity of the vineyard and paying their rent to the owner at harvest time in the form of a share of the produce. So far, so good, business as usual. But then everything falls apart. The landlord's slaves are sent to collect his share of the harvest, the rent, as it were. The tenants attack the rent collectors, beating one and killing another. So the owner sends another slave detail. Things are no longer normal. The second delegation is treated worse than the first, but instead of appealing to the authorities to educate what was clearly an unlawful situation, the vineyard owner decides to send his son. That seems like a strange move on the part of the landlord, given the history of these troublesome tenants. Just as strange is the reasoning on the part of the tenants when the landlord's son arrives. They think that if they kill the landlord's heir, they will get his inheritance. Are you following the twisted logic playing out here? Hold on, because it's almost time for the punchline. Jesus asks his listeners, the chief priests and elders of the temple, now, when the landowner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? The answer is intuitively obvious to those listening. He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus lets that answer ring around the temple walls. Then he asks his challengers, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. And then Jesus adds a real zinger. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Time for a confession. This parable is not a favorite of mine. I find it difficult to hear, let alone preach. I looked back through my sermon files this week and discovered that in the 34 years I've been preaching from the common lectionary, this is only the second time I've preached a sermon on this parable. And I'll tell you why. It's much too easy to misinterpret. 
A blog I read recently by a preacher named Michael Anthony Howard expresses my problem with this text. Two major challenges are evident. First, this text has been so spiritualized by an anti-Semitic church that it makes it hard for me to even read it without a deep sense of anger. For centuries, church leaders have interpreted every negative character in Jesus' parables as a reference to the Jews. This misreading of the text not only leads to the kind of ethnic religious violence that caused the pogroms and the crusades and the holocaust but secondly to make things worse it removes the church from any sense of complicity in the sins alluded to in the parable and pushes them off on others in other words this kind of christian triumphalist interpretation where the bad guys in the text are always look like someone other than ourselves inhibits us from any kind of repentant response professor ringus says we who are christians have tended to read the parable seeing god as the landowner and the temple leaders as the thoroughly evil tenants who were defrauding God of the rightful fruits of God's covenant with Israel. In this allegory, the groups of servants are Israel's prophets and Jesus is the son. We Christians in turn are the other tenants to whom the vineyard will be given after it's taken from the Jerusalem leaders who've not managed it well. Seen as an allegory of salvation history from Matthew's perspective, even to the point of depicting Jesus, who would be crucified outside Jerusalem as the son who is killed outside the vineyard, this parable becomes an opening salvo from Jesus himself, justifying the church's claims against the Jewish leader and even against Judaism as a whole. Now, the reason I find it difficult to preach on this parable is it becomes it because it presents the church with such a difficult challenge. As a preacher, it's much easier to let the words of Jesus stay on his lips, especially if they're words of condemnation, instead of letting those words address those of us who would be his followers. It's easy to let the words of Jesus sound like a condemnation of the Jews. But what if we allow ourselves to wonder if the parable of the wicked tenants could be a critique of the church and not just the chief priests and elders of the temple in his day? After all, this is a parable. The way it is supposed to work is by causing the hearer to ponder his or her place in the story. If the parable is to function as a parable and not just an allegory, it must be heard in a way that confounds our self-understanding, just as it did for the chief priests and the elders of the temple who first heard it. Today is World Communion Sunday, as good a Sunday as any for Christians to consider our role in this parable, especially we privileged Christians in the developed world. World Communion Sunday was first designated by the Presbyterian Church in 1936 to mark the unity of the Christian church and express the hope for peace in the world. In 1940, World Communion Sunday was proposed by the National Council of Churches as a worldwide ecumenical celebration of Christian unity. Of course, we all know what happened in the world and, and to the church in the following five years. The Christian nations of the Western Hemisphere fought the most devastating war in human history and six million Jews were exterminated, arguably the result of the anti-Semitism that found its roots in a misreading of Christian scriptures, like our gospel lesson for this morning. 
so much for the high-minded thoughts of unity and peace by the church that looks to Jesus as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, in the words of the letter to the Hebrews. But it takes more than a world war to wipe away the hopes of the church for unity and peace. So here we are, 84 years after the first World Communion Sunday, still bearing witness to what we hope will one day come about, the fulfillment of the prayer Jesus offered on the last night of his mortal life, that his followers might all become one. What does the church need to do to move forward toward the vision inherent in the prayer of Jesus, toward the hope expressed by the World Communion Sunday? For the church to experience the unity Jesus prayed for, perhaps what we need is more humility. Today, as we eat and drink the bread and cup Jesus offers us, we will have been touched by half the planet. Think of it. The wheat for the bread we break to observe the Last Supper was grown in the American Midwest. The grapes for the cup we will share were probably picked by Latin American migrant farm workers. The coffee or tea or sugar we'll share in our virtual coffee hour will have come from Kenya or Costa Rica or India or the Dominican Republic. It's likely that something you're wearing right now came from a factory in Bangladesh or Vietnam or Haiti, and we know that the cell phone in your pocket or purse came from China. If we're worshiping at the lighthouse, we'll go home in cars that even if they were built in America, they are the product of a global supply chain. And when we consider the fact that we are sharing the planet's air and water with five and a half billion other people, it's not a stretch to say that we are in communion with the whole wide world every day. Think about that as remembering Jesus, praying that we might all be one. Back to the parable of those troublesome tenants for a moment. Jesus used parables when he wanted his listeners to question themselves. On this World Communion Sunday, might we Christians in the developed world ask ourselves whether we are bearing the fruit of the kingdom? Jesus said the kingdom of God would be taken away and given to those who will bear the fruit of the kingdom. What do you suppose he meant? Shall we pray? O Lord, as we prepare to break bread together, remind us that we do not receive the sacrament alone. We are part of a long line of diverse brothers and sisters who have more in common than anything that can ever seek to divide us. We have you in common. We have the body of Christ in common. On this World Communion Sunday, may this sacred act of receiving the sacrament of communion be a visible expression of the unity that we have through you as we reflect on what it means to be siblings in Christ during these challenging times, we especially think of those who are struggling with health concerns, those grieving the loss of loved ones, those who've lost jobs and livelihoods, those facing eviction or foreclosure, those unable to buy food or clothing or medicine, We share in their struggles because we are part of the same family. Oh God, we are part of your family. And we are part of a nation that needs healing and hope. We pray for the health of our president, as we pray for all those afflicted by the virus that has sickened and divided this nation. Remind us, O God, that we are all part of your family and that it is your will, O God, that we might all be one. O Lord, make haste to help us. 
Amen. Now, more than ever, we need places of community, of civility, of faith, and of hope. Old North Church is striving to be that church for you and for our neighborhood. We can't do it alone. Thank you for giving to this ministry so that we can keep being a beacon of God's light. If you'd like to give, you can mail checks to the office at 8 Stacy Street or donate at the link right here. For all the ways you offer yourself to this church and to each other, we give thanks. Let's pray now to, get, to dedicate to all these offerings we have received. Generous God, we give you but your own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is yours alone. We give it gratefully. Amen. Today is World Communion Sunday, when faithful people all across the globe, in Marblehead and San Francisco, in Paris and Wuhan and Nairobi, come together to receive God's grace and be connected by God's love. If you are alone today at your table, know that you are not alone. You eat with us and with Christians all over. I'm at my dining room table with my wife, Ashley. We've got a pumpkin roll that I made and some orange juice. I invite you now to gather some food to break and some drink to pour. While you set your table, enjoy seeing images of the bread our children have made for this Sunday in years past while Holly sings for us. Beloved, God is with us. God has created us to live faithfully in these times. We lift our hearts to the one who shapes us into communities of grace and peace. Let us pray. God of all, we tremble in these moments of uncertainty, of days which seem endless, wondering if there is any word for us. Remind us that you spoke into the trembling emptiness of chaos and your goodness and wonder began all those days and nights when grace bubbled up from springs, when peace wandered the meadows. All these gifts were and still are created for those you made in your image. Even when we grumble in the wilderness or live in the exile of fear and worry or seek to have our way, not yours. In every moment when your people were alone, felt abandoned by all, you sent prophets to remind us of your promises and point us to all the ways you continue to love. 
even in these months of isolation, even in these days which all seem the same, even in those moments when we are alone, you are with us. In the life and the promises made known in the child you sent to point us to the way home to you. So with those who trembled at the foot of your holy mountain, and with those who press on to follow you, we join our voices in praise to you. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Even in these days, we praise and worship and trust you, God. We come to these tables to meet Jesus. In these times when we wonder if anyone really cares about us, he is the one who is your love poured out for us, each of us. In these days when bitter voices would seek to seduce us with anger, he is the gentle voice which calls us to trust in your heart, broken for us. In the moments when people seem not to care for the most vulnerable, for those most at risk from this virus and from white supremacy, Jesus is the living demonstration that death has no ultimate power, but that your resurrecting love is the final word spoken about us. As we would seek to model his gentleness and grace in these overwhelming times, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ lived and died and rose again, that all might know the unconquerable love and power of God from which nothing can separate us. Now around tables and altars and sacred spaces which echo with silence, around kitchen counters and picnic blankets, we pray. Redeemer of all creation, that you would pour out your spirit on each and every place, on each and every person, whether it is bread that is broken or crackers that are split. May these ordinary gifts remind us that you are present in the ordinary beauty of our days. Whether it is a mug of tea, a glass of wine or juice, or even a glass of water, may this be your grace poured into us so that we might become people who will not give up on justice, people who will not let go of hope, people who will not hoard life, people who will trust in you always. We remember that on the night before he was handed over to suffering and death, Jesus took the bread that was on the table and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. People of God, take and eat the bread of life. Ashley, the bread of life for you. Amen. Lindsay, the bread of life for you. Amen. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. After the meal was over, Jesus poured out another glass of wine, gave thanks to God for it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. People of God, take and drink the cup of hope. Lindsay, this is the cup of hope for you. Amen. Ashley, the cup of hope for you. Thanks be to God.
one by this meal you have brought hope when so much seems hopeless you have brought connection in a time of isolation and enmity you have brought comfort to our troubled hearts and strength to our weak spirits and for all of that we say thank you amen Friends, you were called to Christ's table. You were fed at Christ's table. You were united at Christ's table. Now you are sent from Christ's table into all the world. Go therefore into the world with courage. Set a place for all who hunger and fill a cup for all who thirst. And as you go, may the spirit of power and love attend you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uphold you, and may the great faithfulness of our God sustain you, now and forever. Amen.